Hello, thank you for the opportunity to present our work on the development of engineered models for vascular malformations. I apologize that I am not able to attend the meeting in person uh, due to a scheduling conflict, but I hope to meet all of you at a future meeting and hopefully next year. Um, we're sort of new to the vascular malformation space, so um, I'm excited to get some feedback and suggestions on potential avenues for future work um, with what I'm about to show. So please feel free to uh, reach out to me via email, um, which is on this slide and again on the last slide. Um, so the work I'm about to present today is primarily, was primarily done by Dr. Wen, a uh, research assistant professor and molecular cell biologist um, in my lab. So uh, just a brief introduction to our group and what we do. Um, as it, it's, it might be slightly different than those of you with uh, clinical interests or, or interests in um, cell signaling. So um, my lab is interested in how mechanical signals affect um, cell biology. And we think about mechanical signals as arising from both the solid phase and from the fluid phase. Most traditional uh, uh, efforts into understanding mechanotransduction or the process by which cells convert mechanical signals to biological responses focus solely on one phase, such as the stiffness of the extracellular matrix or the effects of shear stress um, or wall shear stress from things like flowing blood or interstitial fluid. Our group tries to look at these in, uh, together because many of the signaling pathways activated by the solid phase are also activated by the fluid phase. And also because at a mechanical level, uh, forces from the fluid uh, are balanced in part by stresses in the solid phase. So both at a mechanical and biological level, um, mechanical signals are uh, coupled from the fluid and solid phase. So our general approach is to use microfluidic approaches. These involve techniques borrowed from the semiconductor industry to fabricate structures with micron or millimeter length scales. Um, and to then use these as housing for three-dimensional biomaterials in which we can introduce cells along surfaces or pattern them or um, culture them within the hydrogel itself. And there's several advantages to this approach. One is that the microfluidics allow control of pressure and flow, while the 3D biomaterials allow us to recapitulate some degree of the native architecture and mechanical properties of um, the extracellular matrix. But also these are all de designed to interface with high-resolution imaging. So we can see uh, processes at the cellular and subcellular scale. Um, so just as a general overview to two of the approaches um, that my lab uses now for the study of vascular malformations that'll serve as the basis for some of the data that I'll present later in the talk. Um, we use photolithography and soft lithography, two, two pretty standard techniques in the microfluidics world, to pattern structures on the surface of silicon wafers um, here you can kind of see the outline of, of a microfluidic device um, that's raised on this kind of shiny silicon wafer. Um, we can then pour polydimethylsiloxane or a, a liquid two-part uh, polymer rubber that we can cross-link on the surface of the silicon and then peel off after it, it cross-links or polymerizes. And what this does is it takes any any raised surface off the silicon um, and converts it into a channel within the rubber or the PDMS. So now we can create channels this way and we can create little voids or chambers in which to introduce three-dimensional hydrogels. If we first introduce a needle or some other sacrificial material, when then inject a uh, pre-polymerized hydrogel into the central region, we can allow the gel to polymerize, remove the needle, and be left with a cylindrical void um, in the hydrogel that we can backfill with endothelial cells um, or other cell types um, as necessary. Here we're just showing a single needle or a single channel, but we can create things like divergent channels or multiple channels in parallel or um, in series as necessary for a given biological question. But what we end up with are things that look a bit like blood vessels or, or smaller blood vessels. This is uh, an example image, actin in green, um, a DAPI stain in magenta, and sort of the same vessel, but um, separating out V cadherin immunostained um, and shown in gray here. Um, these, this vessel is about 160 microns across, and it was formed with uh, human dermal microvascular endothelial cells. Um, and this is a maximum intensity projection, so it's a little bit hard to see the geometry, but what we're looking at is 
um, sort of looking from the top down at a cylinder whose lumen um, is sort of running below this surface of the cell, uh, this, this cell surface, and surrounded by a three-dimensional collagen type 1 hydrogel. Um, so the cells can remodel this hydrogel. Um, they can invade if we give them proangiogenic cues. Um, but importantly, we can also adjust fluid pressure at the inlet and the outlet, and also in the interstitial space to drive luminal, transmural, mural, or interstitial flow um, as necessary. This is what we call a, a top-down approach, one where we specify a structure, then backfill with endothelial cells. The other approach that we use um, that was developed by Roger Cam and others, um, but is to introduce cells embedded as single cells within the hydrogel as we inject it into a device. That here, this is a slightly different device structure. Um, it's one in which there is not a needle running through the hydrogel. Um, it is just a central channel that contains individual HUVEX embedded within fibrin. We can allow the fibrin to polymerize, and if we give them our sort of right cues, sometimes fibroblasts are necessary, these cells will self-assemble into something that looks a bit like a vascular network um, using some signaling pathways that are upregulated during developmental vasculogenesis. So this is sometimes called a vasculogenesis assay. Um, but the benefit of this assay is that if we get the cell concentration right, and we let them go for long enough, we can set up these kind of perfusible vascular networks. So one in which, ones in which we can hold sort of a top channel here, a top vessel at a slightly higher pressure than a bottom vessel. And we can drive flow through structures that look a bit like capillary networks, or at least they're luminized and interconnected like a capillary network would be. So this allows us to look at topology and barrier function in response to different cues from the solid and fluid phase. The solid phase being the hydrogel, which is not shown here, that is sort of interconnected um, or exists in the space between the red endothelial cells. To refer a sense of scale here, um, the, each, the, the gap between these uh, two channels is about one millimeter. So when I first arrived to UNC, um, I got a phone call from uh, Dr. Julie Blatt, who is a clinician and the former chief of the UNC Vascular Anomalies Clinic. And uh, she wanted to work with us on the development of NOTCH inhibitors um, for the treatment of vascular malformations. NOTCH is a protein and a signaling pathway that our lab studies extensively. Um, but as we started to plan out some experiments, we realized we didn't have a good assay for testing the efficacy of compounds um, for vascular malformations. So this led to a discussion of, could we build an in vitro model that allows us to test um, potential drug targets and whether or not they revert malformed vascular vasculature, blood or lymphatic vasculature to more normal topologies. We started by thinking about um, using cells overexpressing PIK3CA activating mutations as a model system for the vascular malformations, in part based on prevalence at the UNC Vascular Anomalies Clinic, but also um, based on, on published uh, reports of prevalence nationwide. And we're particularly interested in a couple of these um, hotspot activating mutations. These are uh, mutations in the PIK3CA gene <clears throat> that lead to activation of PI3K signaling. So our general approach was to see if we could use cells that we understand well, these HUVEX, we started with HUVEX, but we've now expanded to considering lymphatic endothelial cells, and to use lentiviral transduction to introduce vectors that encode either mutated, these hotspot overactivating or activating um, mutants of PIK3CA, or wild type or healthy, uh, or, or uh, wild type PIK3CA, or um, empty vectors. So to uh, create stable lines of HUVEX expressing each one of these, and then to take them and introduce them into microfluidic devices using the kind of vasculogenesis technique I described earlier, to allow them to assemble vascular networks and to see if there's any difference between the kind of control or wild type and those overexpressing the mutants. And we started by just culturing these cells in 2D um, to check to see if the cells uh, demonstrated phenotypes consistent with what had been previously published in the literature. And we see that in cells expressing the two, two of the activating mutations that we um, are considering here, we, we see 
a uh, increase in stress fiber formation. That's what's sh these shown in the F actin stain in the top row here. These kind of bundled actin fibers um, go up, and these activating mut mutants. The cells are also generally larger, um, and there's sort of down regulation of cell cell adherence junctions, as shown um, by a V cadherin immunostain. We also see upregulation of uh, various signals associated with PI3K signaling, suggesting that indeed in these cells um, that we've engineered to overexpress these activating mutations, there is an overactivation of um, PI3K and via PIK3CA. And these changes in um, cell area and relative junction area, which um, indicate sort of the uh, affinity of, or the, the, the strength of cell-cell adherence junctions. These have all been reported previously, so this is um, in some ways a validation that our cells are behaving as we would expect them to based on previous publications. But before jumping into microfluidics, um, we first just graded well plates where we seeded individual endothelial cells within fibrin gels um, in 96 well plates. Actually, this is a slightly smaller format than that. These are custom um, plates that we make with PDMS uh, to allow us to image certain ways. Um, but in the top row here, you can see a GFP signal. So this labels either the empty vector or cells that are expressing each one of these uh, PIK3CA constructs. It, it, it's not a fusion construct. The GFP signal is not attached to any of the products of PIK3CA. It is um, just labeling the cytoplasm of cells that have gotten the virus um, and that we we think should be expressing the, the mutants. And in the bottom, we see phase contrast image, which allows us to see the sort of structure of um, the cells in hydrogel a little bit better. And on the left side, you can see that these cells are sort of assembling into something that maybe looks a little bit like a vascular network, while on the right, we see very large defects um, and sort of holes that start to emerge in the extracellular matrix. If we look a little bit closer, we do see maybe not lumens forming in the vector control quite yet, but we at least see the cells elongate and interconnect with one another. Whereas on the right side with these PIK3CA activating mutations, we see what sort of look like maybe sheets of cells rather than um, sort of interconnected tubes of cells or cords of cells. Um, <clears throat> and these 3D reconstructions show that in a little bit more detail. Here you can see in the, the activating mutations, we end up with sort of, again, sort of cell sheets, whereas um, in the wild type case, we get these interconnected cords of cells. Um, and this is consistent with what uh, some people have shown in similar uh, mouse models where you do end up with sort of gaps, large gaps between vessel structures, but each one of the, what would be a capillary bed shows very high microvascular area because the, the vasculature is sort of is malformed, not into individual vessels, but kind of into um, sacs and, and other structures um, that are not present in the, he in the healthy vasculature. So in some ways, this is consistent with what had been reported previously, but the assay itself was a little bit messy. As I, as I said before, we didn't see luminization of these structures. So we moved then to the microfluidic device, um, the vasculogenic microfluidic device, which allows us a bit tighter control over the volumes involved. We can also introduce um, support cells if necessary to drive luminization. Turns out we don't need them in this model, but we could, we, we did, and we tried to introduce them um, to sort of move things along. Um, and what you see here in the, in the top row is this sort of empty vector control, where in the bottom row, we're seeing one of the, the activating mutations. And and I think most striking in the, the fibrin channel, so this is an inverted image where um, the sort of dark signal is a fluorescent uh, fibrinogen that's incorporated in a fibrin hydrogel, we see really large gaps in cells expressing the activating mutation that are not present um, in the empty vector control. Now, if we look at the cell structure, similarly, we can see that these kind of voids within the fibrin hydrogel are lined by endothelial cells and they form these kind of open bulbous sacs more so than um, the interconnected network that are seen in the, in the wild type. And this again has been consistent with what has been seen in animal models. And in fact, um, is consistent with some of the feedback we got from clinicians that, that these kinds of voids um, are present in, in lesions and in patients who have these um, PIK3CA driven vascular malformations. So with this as our phenotype, 
where there's large degradation of, of the hydrogel um, and sort of malformed, as we would call them, vascular structures, um, we we decided to use this in collaboration with um, with Dr. Blatt to screen for a number of compounds to see if we can get these structures to look a bit more like the wild type. Uh, first of all, I should state that these uh, <clears throat> that we we noticed a number of defects, not just in in the extracellular matrix degradation, but in um, proliferation rates, um, and also perhaps mechanical forces that are being applied by each of the cells that I'll show in the neighboring slide. So we characterize that a bit by doing a screen for MMP um, secretion or just protease secretion, because we also include um, fibrinolysis <coughs> um, proteins here. But you can see broadly that what we're looking at here is this uh, PIK3CA542 um, mutant, and these are a number of compounds that we test throughout um, uh, throughout the study. But you can see that in the case of DMSO, so the untreated cells, we see um, uh, upregulation more or less across the board of these MMPs and fibrinolytic um, proteins consistent with the formation of, of the voids in these networks. We also found that if we blocked uh, MMP secretion or we blocked proliferation of the cells, we maybe reverted some of the phenotypes, but we didn't fully recover the sort of healthy vascular network like um, topology. Um, important to us in the mechanobiology community, we also saw a really, really interesting uh, phenotype somewhat by accident. So we accidentally created devices in which these little posts, um, which are present to constrain the cell containing hydrogel to just the central region, but allow open channels on the left and right to provide media, um, we accidentally created posts that were not well adhered to the bottom of the device. So they could sort of move. They acted as cantilevers. And you can see that in the G GFP case, we see the cells moving around um, as they form these, these networks. We see some holes emerge as the cells luminize and sort of create space within the fibrin, but the posts remain relatively rigid. Whereas in the 542 case, we see sort of less cell movement um, in the uh, sort of shape of vascular network structures, what we see enlargement of holes, and we also see significant deformations um, of the posts as the cells um, rearrange. So this suggests that in addition to degradation of the matrix, there's something about cytoskeletal regulation um, that is off or different in these cells, which would be consistent with what we saw in 2D, to be clear, but that these forces are being transmitted across maybe a tissue length scale, suggesting um, some involvement of the cytoskeleton in, in these structures. So the first thing that we did was test two of the compounds that are being clinically evaluated um, in the treatment of, of vascular malformations, so um, rapamycin or serolimus and alpalisib, which is a PIK3CA inhibitor. And interestingly, though we expect that these two compounds, serolimus uh, here and alpalisib up here, the PIK3CA inhibitor, we expect them to work um, similarly, just at different points of, of the, uh, in the pathway. What we saw is that treatment with serolimus resulted in a hyperbranching phenotype. There are lots of these cell protrusions that exist. And if we zoom out and look at the topology of the networks, we see excessive branching in, uh, in cells that are treated with serolimus. And so at the same time, Dr. Ah, who was working on this project, she's, she's sort of an expert in cytoskeletal regulation. And she was thinking about this other arm of PI3K signaling and how it might play a role in the formation of vascular malformations. And in particular, the role of RAC activation that leads to downstream um, MECRC activation um, through this kind of arm of PIK3CA signaling that's um, dependent on these GTPases. And so the first thing she did was she started to look at um, how the cells moved and their actin ruffling profiles, which are signatures of RAC activation. And, and indeed, she saw that in the mutant cells, there was, uh, there was upregulation of actin ruffling on the melopodial formation. And if we tracked uh, the migration, we see that despite all this ruffling, the cells don't move in a directed fashion as much as they do in the GFP controls, which is suggestive of RAC overactivation. 
And indeed, if we did uh, RAC activity assay, we see that RAC is, is constitutively or is upregulated um, in the uh, cells that uh, express these PIK3CA activating mutations. So we attempted to manipulate this pathway by treatment with trametinib um, by in, inhibiting sort of one of these downstream um, effectors of RAC signaling. That's this middle panel here. And we saw some restoration of the vascular network. Um, we see we end up with a sort of perfusible network. It maybe doesn't look exactly like um, the healthy wild type controls that we saw previously, um, but it certainly re restored the phenotype um, in ways that targeting the uh, individual cell proliferation or matrix uh, degradation did not. Um, so this is kind of a lot of work to show in a short period of time. I'm skipping a lot of the biochemistry, but I, I suggest if you're interested to check out uh, Dr. Oz's paper, which recently came out this spring. Um, but right now we're trying to address um, sort of shortcomings of this model um, using the overexpression constructs by developing um, by developing light inducible or drug inducible constructs that allow us to turn on the activating mutation with some spatial spatio temporal resolution. We're seeing some some good preliminary results from that. These are light activatable um, transduced Huvex up here. Um, and that would allow us to do things like mosaic studies to see how one cell that gets pic 3 ca turned on affects topology of the entire network itself. Um, to study a little bit of how these cells are, are uh, how signals are transmitted across the vascular network during development of these of these networks. And we've also started to explore um, the development, or we have developed actually similar assays in lymphatic endothelial cells to, um, to, to look at um, lymphatic malformations. So with that, I'd like to thank my group and the collaborators. We're a highly collaborative lab as, as tool, tool builders and developers. Um, and I want to thank in particular um, Dr. Julie Blatt for introducing us to the challenges and uh, in the treatment of vascular malformations. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Please email me directly or check out um, our group and our website um, if you have further questions or suggestions on how we could improve our work. Um, thanks again for the opportunity.